Welcome uh, for the Finance Committee. Uh, hopefully other council members will join us. Um, I'd like to call the Finance Committee meeting to order. The first thing we have is assignment for request for council action. We have several for the Finance Committee. We have 21-210 budget amendments, 21-211 amend resolution number 4621 grant application, targets of opportunity CDBG CV, 21-212 discussion electric aggregation program community energy advisors, 21-213 second amendment to EMS agreement with Manana Hospital, 2214, 2022 membership renewal to Main Street, Medina. 21215, amend salaries and benefits code 3105, sanitation department, motor equipment operators. <clears throat> 21216, purchase fitness equipment, MCRC, American Rescue Plan funds, ARP. <clears throat> 21217, purchase of ADA swim lifts, MCRC, ARP funds. 21218, purchase of new step trainers, MCRC, ARP funds. 21219, field expansion project, Miracle League Parks Department. 21220, expenditure for Mason Custom Builders Service Department, ARP funds. 21221, amend code 94309, special lot endowment fund. 21222, 2022 health insurance renewal, medical mutual. 21223, Repay fund advances, 21224, rollover outstanding fund advances, and 21225, fund advance request. The first item we have is budget amendments. We have 21038. Uh, Keith, these just look like academic development payments. We need to appropriate the money. It's, it's uh, money comes in, but in order to spend it, we have to get it appropriated. Yep. Any questions? Move to approve. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed? Motion carries. 21, uh, 2021 Keith? Most of this is the advances that we're going to discuss down at the bottom of the uh, agenda, and then there's some other places where there's negatives that we're covering. Yeah, there's a lot of it for all the various departments. Okay. Move to approve. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed? Motion carries. Uh, third one we have is 21-211, which is amending resolution 4621, targets of opportunity grant. Barbara? Uh, when you approved it initially, the figures were a little off. Um, we've got the final figures now, and um, the, they are bidding the projects, so we need to get this uh, resolved so we can go ahead and cut purchase orders. So the revised numbers are shown there? Is yes, that the, they are correct. The 355500 plus the 34500 and $1,000, so it's 391 Yes. Okay. An emergency clause. An emergency clause is requested on this. So anybody have any questions? Hey, Barbara? Move to approve with the emergency clause. Second, including the emergency clause. All in favor? Aye. 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 All opposed? Motion carries. Um, next one we have is 21-212, discussion on community for, from community energy advisors regarding electric aggregation. Mr. Piccoli. Thank you, Mr. President. If uh, council recalls, we uh, came to you to renew the potential renewal of the electric aggregation program with Energy Harbor, formerly known as First Energy Solutions. <clears throat> Excuse me, we were, we obtained a price of about 4.7 cents, 4.8 cents, at that time for kilowatt hour. Um, and we did not um, endorse the emergency clause at that time. So shortly after that, uh, Mr. Miller from the uh, county had called over and they were working with community energy advisors who are here tonight. Um, and he, and he, they thought, and we thought, with the uh, collaborative effort of the city and the entire county joining, could obtain a better uh, price. So that's where we're at. Um, the market, however, in, Mr. Uh, Lowry Young will talk to that, speak to that. So I'd like to introduce um, Community Energy Advisor Kevin Lowry Young, and then Matt Burrington is here with him as well, sitting on the bench. So thank you. Thank you, Nino. Yeah. Good evening. I'm Kevin Lowry Young with Community Energy Advisors. We're a, a Medina based company. Uh, we've been in business uh, in Medina here for a little over eight years now. I'd also like to I'm a co-founder and a, a principal with Community Energy Advisors, and 
with me tonight, as Nino said, is uh, Matthew Burrington. He is, he's one of our energy analysts. Uh, please go to the first slide. What I'd like to, um, in, in five or 10 minutes, go through with you um, the history of your program, uh, a little bit about the process um, that we've gone through on your behalf in the last month, uh, talk to you about the forward uh, market curves, some of the expectations around pricing, and then finish up with uh, um, an opportunity for any questions or, or discussion. Next slide, please. First, a bit about the current, uh, the current program. Your current electric government aggregation program has been, in a, uh, been active since 2010. Um, it's been a variable priced product that's offered to the community that's been indexed against the standard utility rate. It's commonly referred to as the PTC or the price to compare. Um, you have, you um, most recently have about 7,000 residential and small commercial accounts that participate in your program that use over 76 million kilowatt hours a year. That's an average of about 11,000 kilowatt hours per account per year. Um, we, uh, we were engaged in October and issued an RFP um, a request for proposal to different suppliers and three uh, of the most active government aggregation suppliers in the state of Ohio responded back and I'll share with you some highlights of their proposals uh, in a few minutes. Um, so next slide please. This slide depicts where um, in the most recent three years the pricing has been for the program. So you can see the vertical lines there, that, there's three sections. That first section is 2019, the middle section is the COVID year of 2020, and the third section is 2021. You, you see the bump in the, the hump in the middle of each year, that's the summertime. It's a variable price and the utility company's standard price that you were discounted off of um, is the highest in the summertime. If you see the peak over on the far right on that orange curve, this past summer, the program's price um, got above six cents per kilowatt hour, uh, and we all felt uh, some of the effects of that. Um, some of the things driving um, these costs um, were um, increasing the exports of our natural gas, and much of our electricity is generated by natural gas. Um, the Asian and European export markets, we, we've been piped. Um, shipping liquid natural gas, and we've also been piping natural gas to Mexico, um, and the acceleration of the economy after COVID um, caught the market a little off guard. And in fact, um, what's been, deliver what's been um, delivering inexpensive natural gas and electricity to us for a long time, coming from the shale gas regions during COVID, many of those uh, rigs shut down. And so, we still um, have not gotten back up to um, the storage levels. Um, we, the marketplace looks at five-year storage averages, um, and the market keys off of that to make sure that we have enough natural gas in storage. We're not back to the pre-COVID storage levels in natural gas. And that's some of the things. If you go to the next slide, please, where we talk about the past, the past is, it is relevant to us as customers and to our citizens as customers because it becomes part of our budget expectations. But as far as the markets go, it's, it becomes about the future. And what you'll see on this chart is uh, since late 2019, the bulk of this chart is 2020 and 2021. You, if you see the low, the low part before it starts to go up, that's the beginning of, of 2021. Uh, and, you'll, and what you see on this chart are what's called calendar strips. Um, the energy market, electric uh, portion of it is liquid, and they're traded in large volumes. That orange curve that you see on the top that, that went up to about 55, I believe 55 uh, dollars, that's, that's five and a half cents per kilowatt hour um, that, it's, um, that it went up to um, from when it was at about three cents at the beginning of the year. And so that, that is the 2022 calendar strip. 
What we're talking about here for the government aggregation program is a term that would uh, extend from May of 2022 and go through May of 2025. So the calendar strips that you see here that would be driving that, that once the city locks in with a supplier, the supplier goes to the market and purchases that energy on behalf of the government aggregation program. And it would be a combination of really the rates that you see there, that, that orange curve um, that has really, the short term curve is the most expensive. Being this is a finance committee, what we see, what you see before you is called a backward aided market, where the, the farther you go out, the lower the prices are. And, and so the gray curve is the 2023 curve, and then the yellow curve on the bottom is the uh, 2024 curve. And what's significant about this is that while it's backward aided and the, um, the farther you go out, the lower the prices are, as you can see, even those farther out prices um, began really around July or August to, um, to uh, spike up rather dramatically. Next slide, please. Um, I'd like to, the next three slides, I wanna talk uh, a little bit about the non-economic parts of the um, responses we got back from the three suppliers that responded. The first supplier here is the incumbent supplier. Energy Harbor is formerly known as uh, First Energy Solutions. Um, as far as company background, um, they're a very large government aggregation supplier, over 200 programs throughout the state of Ohio. As far as their bid, they, they agreed to all of the parameters and the performance requirements that um, we had requested in the RFP. The one thing that I would hi highlight is that all things being equal, they are offering a carbon-free product to our citizens. Um, it's not going to it's not going to earn a renewable energy certificate, or it's not going to earn um, a sustainability certificate um, because it's nuclear power, um, which is in in some in many places and with what the federal government is trying to drive towards, it doesn't rise to the level of renewable energy like solar and wind, but it is nevertheless carbon free. Next slide, please. The next supplier has been very competitive with um, your incumbent supplier and it's Dynagy. Dynagy. Dynagy is formerly a Ohio company in Cincinnati and they were acquired by Vistra um, about three years ago. Um, they're also a large government aggregation supplier um, and they're a, they're a large national company. What's significant that I would point out on their bid, in addition to agreeing to all the parameters, is they're, they're the only ones that offer uh, grant dollars that's not tied to the price. All of them will build into the price grant dollars that the city would be able to use for projects that it deems um, appropriate. But in this case, th this is, they are offering for qualifying efficiency programs such as um, an upgrade of LED lights, perhaps it's, it would be an upgrade of um, HVAC equipment that exceeds certain Energy Star or efficiency standards. Um, for qualifying projects, um, they would pay out uh, up to $15,000 a year. So in a three-year contract, it would be worth an additional $45,000 um, to the city for use on efficiency projects. Next slide, please. Finally, direct energy, um, we have, we, after receiving initial bids, they were significantly out of the running in terms of um, the price offer. Um, they're a very good um, energy supplier as well. And I would say that um, as the city uh, approaches um, finalizing bids and moving into a contracting phase, we would refresh pricing with direct energy as well. Um, I would point out that uh, we do ask about data security. Um, not that there's any, that there's no social security numbers or um, things that we typically protect on our utility bills, but nevertheless, we know it can be embarrassing if we have to explain that your data is out there, people know how much energy you use 
per month and what your energy account information is. It's something that we put on the request for proposal. Direct Energy did identify uh, an issue with, its vend with one of its vendors in 2020, and they remediated that problem. Next slide, please. Now to the pricing analysis, and I apologize, it's, uh, it's pretty small uh, print here, but this was back when we got the first set of rates back in, in response to the request for proposal that was issued, and this was on October 21st. Um, what you see is of the three offers, Energy Harbor had the superior pricing. They were on the 36-month offer, they were um, 1.4 mils uh, better than the other uh, two suppliers. And that's bounced around since then, and I'll show you that briefly on the next slide. What's significant to know is I, told, I shared with you earlier that the annual usage um, of the participants in the program was a little over 76 million kilowatt hours a year. So a mil, when I tell you a mil difference, a mil difference would be the difference between a rate of 5.2 cents and 5.3 cents. Well, that mill difference is worth $76,000 in community spend. In other words, um, a rate of 5.3 cents, um, the rate payers, um, our citizens that participate in the program, would be paying in their utility bills an extra $76,000 a year um, than it, if the rate was 5.2 cents. I hope that's not too confusing. But you can see that the 1.4 mil difference was worth about $100,000 in what I like to call community impact. We also looked at the difference between the 36-month and 24-month terms. 36-month is relevant um, for two reasons. One is the Public Utilities Commission allows for um, the opt-out period to be up to three years. You have to offer the citizens and small businesses the opportunity to opt out of your program at least once every three years. Um, so, but the second reason that it's relevant in this case is when you saw those futures curves earlier, that's why the longer term rate you lock in for, the lower the price is gonna be. That three year average price is lower than the two year average price, and in this case, uh, it was lower by 1.2 mils, and that was worth about $91,000, $92,000 in community impact. Next slide, please. This, uh, this chart is to simply um, to illustrate how we've been tracking. Matt uh, Burrington, our analyst, is requesting updated pricing every day. We're briefing Nino. We're sharing with him uh, the rates that we're getting daily from these top two suppliers. And you can see the EH and the Ds, we've had some switching. We actually got a big, a big bump, a good bump, um, where the rates came down um, when we uh, were able to um, share with the suppliers that they, while not combining the programs of the city and the county, the city and the county desired to collaborate and, and use the market power of their combined usage um, to create some leverage with the suppliers to drive the lowest price possible. Uh, on the day that we did that, um, the rates that were coming in um, went down between a half mil and a mil. So it was a significant bump when we announced that. When I get to the next slide, I, I want to talk briefly about that and then I'll, I'll wrap up my comments. Next slide, please. So we talked about product types. We've been historically on a variable price. We sought variable prices in the request for proposal. Um, for the last five years, there's only been one supplier that has offered a variable price that discount off of the utility price. That was Energy Harbor. Energy Harbor does not offer that product in the marketplace anymore, so a fixed is the product type that we would be looking at for a government aggregation uh, program. Um, the contract and the rate terms talked a little bit about, we, we could do a, um, you can contract with a supplier as long as you want. We, we could go out four or five or six years. Um, typically today, 
supply contracts and government aggregation electric programs do go out three years. It happens to align with that opt-out period that the Public Utilities Commission um, has established. But you could do the three-year and the three-year contract with the supplier, and you could lock in a 12-month rate, and then negotiate a new 12-month rate six months from now, and then do a final 12-month rate. You you can mix and match any way that that um, that you determine or that you choose. Um, but again, as as we demonstrated, that that 36-month price point is. Um, is a better price point than the 24-month price point, and you would even have the ability to go out to 48 months. And to, as of today, a 48-month rate, um, and again, it, midstream, you would have to offer the citizens the ability to opt out 36 months into it. But that 48-month rate is about seven-tenths of a mill lower than the 36-month rate. That can Completes, completes the presentation. I'm, I'm, I'm happy to, to discuss any parts of the presentation with you. Anybody have any questions? Paul? <laughs> oh, oh, thank you. Paul's are gonna be way more intense, so <laughs> I'll just ease you into it. Um, so this, this might be a stupid question, but it's been 10 years since we've renewed this, so I don't know a whole lot about it other than talking with Nino about it. but. The prices we're looking at up here, these rates, are they just for the energy itself or the distribution of the energy as well? Because like at home, I have a different provider right. that I buy the energy from and then Ohio Edison distributes the energy. So what, what's the situation going on here? Correct. So Ohio Edison is our utility company and we can't choose. Okay. Wadsworth has its own municipal distribution company. Um, we're in Ohio Edison here in Medina in the city and the county. So they are responsible for transmission and distribution of the power to our home, and we pay them a rate that is approved by the Public Utilities Commission. 15 years ago, Ohio and 13 other states deregulated either gas or electricity or both. Ohio deregulated both, and that was just for the supply component. So we have the ability as Ohioans to shop uh, for gas and electricity in a competitive marketplace. And so this rate is the supply rate um, that would get added to um, the distribution rate from the utility company. It's what's called consolidated billing. The utility company bills us for the supply component, and when we pay for the utility component and the supply component, then the utility company pays the supplier that we've all chosen either individually or through a government aggregation program to the supplier. Okay, thank you. You're I appreciate welcome. it. <laughs> Paul? Oh, thank you. Um, with regard to the, the, the rate, whatever we agree to on that date, is that, that's going to be the same for two, three, four years, whatever the length of the contract is? That's correct. Okay. Regardless of the market? Regardless of the market. It's, mm -hmm. a, it's a rate lock. Okay. So what vulnerability do we have for, okay, the, the rates go through the roof, say there are 12 cents a kilowatt hour. We're still going to pay 5.4? Yes. And uh, they won't say, yeah, we're going to deny that contract and just that, cut us out? That's correct. You have a contract that's enforceable. Wow. The risk to you is that the prices go down to three cents. That, that's oh, ultimately the risk. Oh, then we still the pay risk. the 5.4. And you still pay 5.4. Okay. The protection for you and, and, and for the deciders of the government aggregation program is that um, we've proposed and, and we... Um, we said in the RFP that we wanted prices that would enable individual customers to opt out anytime they want and not pay any penalty. So should the market take a dip, there's no forecasting. You saw the direction that they're going, but we're, you know, we're one geopolitical event away from the market um, responding in, in different ways. The ultimate protection of our customers is they aren't locked in for 36 months. They're only locked in um, for 30 days after they say they want to get out of the program. And the good news is, is if it did, if the price did dip, let's say it dipped to 4.8 cents and they didn't want to pay the 5.4 cent program rate, they, they get out. If the rates went back up to 7 cents, they could opt back into the program at any time that they wanted as well. And get the lower and rate. And get that lower rate. Yes, sir. Okay. 
All right. Thank you. You're welcome. Bill? Okay, so you've got a lot of good news with, with what you explained. Um, is there any downside to this? Is there any, any, any um, negative thing that could happen? Anything that's not good news? Yeah, the negative thing that could happen is that the market could, the market could go down um, and you're locked in for three years and um, the customers may not be paying attention. They pay their bill for three months and they find out that, gosh, I've been paying 5.4 and if I would have got out of this contract, I would have went back to the utility company and that utility company standard rate was really only 4.8 cents and I've overpaid um, by that amount. And so that, that, that's the risk, that's ultimately the risk. And the, um, the mitigation of that is that in the old days when we first started doing this, there was a 50 or 100 or even a $250 <laughs> fee to early terminate the contract. And so um, ultimately, Anybody can terminate the contract and pay no fee to get out. You've got, yet you our residents have the ability to opt in and opt out of this program any, any time that, any time they want. So the only downside is, you know, 5.4 and, and it goes to 4.8 or 3 point something. Price risk. That's it. That's the only downside. Uh, I was taught never to say the only or everything. I'll have to think about that. I, I, I can't think of anything right now, but there, there could be. I'd be happy to consider that and, um, and provide a response back to you. Great, point. thank you. Well, let me follow up on Bill's question. Sure. Is, the, is a downside possibility the distribution rate, is that locked in by the uh, OPEC, is that right? It or is. is it, or is it, is it the change based upon who supplies the energy? It doesn't change based on who supplies the energy. It, it changes based on the rate filings that Ohio Edison submits to the Public Utilities Commission that they have the ability to approve or disapprove. At any time? At any time. So, but if you go with the Ohio Edison, let's say, or the provider, usually those rate structures could be changed lower because they're the ones supplying the energy. They do, and, and that's what you saw that right. in your current program. You're, you've been 4% off of the standard utility rate, right. so it's indexed to it. And, that, and that's why you've seen the volatility in the rate where um, our, our citizens have paid more in the summertime and less in the spring and fall, and it goes up a little bit in the wintertime. Right, right. Yeah, so there's that variability. So it all depends how it averages out. And I guess the other thing I saw up there is, is we're collaborating with the county. Yes. So I would assume that means that we can't make any decision if we want to collaborate with the county unless the county wants to go along with what we want to go along with. It's not technically true. Um, it, it's true to the extent that there's a relationship um, between the county and the city, but um, the programs are completely independent. Um, and either the city or the county could, there's no requirement to sign a contract at the same time with the other one. And, and so. But if we do, we get a lower rate. If you do, you get a lower rate. Right. That's exactly right. Okay. With That's Nino, right. you had a follow up but question? Oh. It, it becomes challenging because um, you guys might have, there may be some different goals. Um, there may be some different considerations. The goal is to get the best rate and have the best program for all of our you know, citizens that are participating. But if you have different timelines, then it is set up right now that this, this body has ultimate control of its own government aggregation program. And it's, it's our job to make sure that Nino understands what the implications would be of going it alone or if we could synchronize the decision to lock the price at the same time. Nino? Yeah, if I may. Kevin, can you talk a little bit about the grant dollars? I know that the council in the past, we had uh, the $306,000 was given to the city, and then thereafter it was averaging about twenty two, twenty three thousand 23000 the ensuing years when we renewed, and how that will play into what we're doing today, if you don't mind. Thank you. Happy to. So uh, the grant dollars, in effect, are paid by the rate payers. So um, all of the suppliers that bid are willing to build as much into the rate as we need or, or as we 
um, determine we would like to get through the government aggregation program. So it, uh, in this case, for every mill, so if the, the rate without a grant is 5.4 cents per kilowatt hour, if we agreed to a rate of 5.5 cents per kilowatt hour, if you remember the math, one-tenth, one mill or one-tenth of a cent, that's worth $76,000 a year in grant dollars. Um, and I pointed out that there was the one supplier and implicitly it's in their cost, but they don't make it an option in their rate. So all things being equal, if they're at 5.3 cents and Energy Harbor's at 5.3 cents, there, there is $15,000 in grant dollars for energy efficiency projects that is in the energy, no, I apologize, that is in the Dynagy rate proposal. Okay. Now, historically, we're at 5.4, 5.5 cents per kilowatt hour. What, what has been the high or low in the last 10 years? I mean, where have we been? Because uh, I know that this is just going on an uptick right now. Mm -hmm. But over the last 10 years, have we been like at four? And now we're just in a, a higher situation? Yeah. What, what has been historically the rate? Yeah. It, could you please go back two or three slides to the uh, colorful curves? Uh, one more, please. There you go. So you can see that yellow, the yellow line there over the last three years, that's the low, that's the low point, and that was an energy price of, I can't read the writing on here, 4.4 4. 4 cents. Let's call it 4.4 4 cents. Now this is the energy component of the, uh, or this is the whole program price. So there was a month, that month in 2020, the middle of COVID, where it, the price went down, they paid 4.4 cents. And then you can see it went up to, it looks like 4.5 cents um, in October. That looks like between September and October. Um, COVID really was, it, it bottomed out. It's a, it's a supply and demand, like most things, and demand was they were giving away, they were giving away. The suppliers were setting on so much power that they had hedged that had gone unused. Um, there was an opportunity for the utility companies to go out and buy some of that cheap um, energy that they hadn't hedged yet. Um, I, will, I will look at this curve for the last 10 years. I don't have that with me today. Yeah, I was just wondering uh, if it was higher or if know. we were lower. Yeah. I know COVID yeah. was is unique in the situation really in different was. ways because not more people are working at home. That's right. And technically, they were using more power at home than they were at work, but now they That's weren't right. using power at work. So I don't know which is worse yeah. at work or at home. But. The the amount of electricity that per average residential customer has gone up and it's actually stayed up, but in terms of the overall program, there's a lot of commercial usage in here, and the big thing in um, during COVID was the larger industrial users that were buying it from the same, same place. And that was the kind of aggregate or the, um, I guess the macro demand uh, as a country was down significantly last so year. So do you think now that since we're, I mean, I'm not getting too deep into the weeds <laughs> here, but since we're in a situation where we have a supply chain problem and we have a high, high demand, on making of products that the industrial users are ramping up so much that it's causing the price to spike for residential users? It's a good question. It, it's, a, it's an excellent question. I, what's driving our, yes, if, if we have a supply chain issue uh, actually and we, and they're the raw materials and we can't manufacture, that would drive demand for power down. That would have a, um, I guess what you'd, uh, it would have a lowering effect on the price, believe it or not. It's if we, if it did start flowing and we started manufacturing, that would, that would churn it up. And, and that is a lot of the expert expectations that's driving the future curves on the next slide is the expectations for manufacturing to ramp back up um, before the marketplace, the rigs that's generating natural gas, um, to be turned back on um, to replenish our supply and to do that at the same time that, as you know, we're, 
uh, the current administration nationally, we're trying to accelerate renewable energy to have less dependence on that, on natural gas, fossil fuel energy. So it's caused some confusion if you read some articles on energy, which we do every day. Um, there's the increasing demand in the marketplace, and there's a current high price of gas that's causing the, the shale folks to start their rigs, get their rigs going again. But then there, there's taxes for the carbon dioxide emissions of the natural gas that's causing their cost of manufacturing and pulling the gas out of the ground. And then there's the acceleration. If we accelerated to renewable energy with battery storage um, that ultimately replaces nuclear power, gas power, and coal power, then um, the, only, the markets now for natural gas is really the export market um, as we go a little bit faster. And, and so the, the supply chains coming in um, could be bearish on the price of gas, but what's driving up the price of gas right now is Asia and Europe are demanding a lot of liquid natural gas. And it's more profitable for gas in our own backyard to be piped to Louisiana and liquefied and shipped to Europe and China than it is to sell it to us. And that's what's driving our local prices right that's now. That's amazing to me because we we're, yeah. we're next to the largest gas yeah. supply, natural gas supply in the right. world, but yet yeah. prices are going up, which is kind of, I feel like I'm back in college. Yeah. <laughs> is this, do you feel like you're back in college? You're wow, not. that was a long time ago. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I, I mean, that's a very interesting uh, perception. And I guess the, the thing we have to determine on council on that is what do we do? I mean, because if we lock in too soon, that could be bad because we know a lot of the residents in the city are not going to follow it and then opt out. So there, there's a risk there. Uh, but I don't know. Nino, you had other comments? Yeah, just one last statement. The, uh, with respect to the kilowatt hours, I think we're all in agreement that days of the high fours are gone and the low fives is what we're looking at realistically. I'm not an analyst, but in, in, in what I've looked at and talking to folks. And the other thing is, the mayor will tell you, we've received numerous calls because Energy Harbor sent a letter out. You should have received them as well. With the uh, expectation of 12-1, December 1st, the aggregation program will uh, be terminated. And um, folks are wanting to know what we're going to do. Are we renewing? They want advice. So they do, look at, they do look at their electric bills, especially some of, the, uh, some of our older folks. So. I'm try no, to do the right the, thing by them. Yeah, this is a, uh, Thank a, you. a tough decision we have to look at, and, you know, we got good options, and, uh, you know, I guess this was a discussion tonight, so I think in the next two weeks we got to get a little bit more uh, uh, traction about what we want to do, and, and we'll probably get new numbers coming in in the next two weeks, too, to see where we're going. So, but we appreciate the information, uh, Kevin, and, and anybody has any questions, I'm, I'm sure they can call you and talk to you about it if they'd like. Um, you know, if you want to get more in depth into the discussion of energy, they know what's going on, I guess. So, Mr. President, you do. Mrs. Hazeltine, um, just to share, to put things in perspective a little bit, as I mentioned, my own electricity at home, um, the electricity itself is provided by a different provider. So the whole time we've been having this conversation, I'm pulling up my statements on my electric bill to see how much I'm paying and seeing if it's consistent. Currently, I'm at 6.19 cents. So I'm actually paying more than what they're proposing. <laughs> well. So it kind of puts it in perspective what's, what's out there and what people are charging. Mr. Coyne. Yes, Mayor. Just one other thing. Uh, what the county has done, and I'm not suggesting that, but something for you to consider, is they've given discretion to the county administrator that if the number hits this target, he has a right to sign those papers. Uh, and, and council can give that due, due consideration. We can talk about it again in two weeks. But the problem is if the number hits the number we're looking for and we have to come back and go through finance and council, that number is not there again. So just I know we generally don't do things in, in that manner, but um, in, in this particular case, looking at those graphs, um, it may be something we want to make an exception for and give some consideration of that. I just offer that to you. Okay, thanks. Yes, you know, sir. 
Sorry, Mary, you brought up a good point, and I was talking with Kevin, and I was, I guess, shocked to hear that the utility will not hold a rate for longer than 24 hours. So what the mayor references point on, and we should have talked about that a little bit, because to hold a rate for 24 hours and to come back to council, I mean, we, by the time we would go through the process, that rate would be long gone. And, and, and that's no, what- No, I get, I get it, and I guess, I, I think everybody on council would agree today, we'd do it if it's at 3.2. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right. Uh, we're in. Yeah. We're in. So if it hits 3.2, you have full authority to sign anything. All right, well, keep that in mind. Let's go through it and think about it. And then next week, we have to make a decision if you want to do the lock in rate thing, if you want to keep it up or down, what you want to do. So it's a lot of good information that we got tonight. So, Bye. so Thank you. But do you want to wait for two weeks or do you want to give authority tonight? I want to wait two weeks personally. You, you guys can take what you want to do, but I mean, again, acting rashly is usually the worst form of you know decision making that I think is I mean of course we're gonna, pretty well for but me. everything everything that goes up and down you heard what's going on out there things are going to be volatile so yeah. in the in the volatility do you just jump in and say this is what I'm going to do because it could go to seven right but it could also go back down to four I mean it could go all over the place there's no prediction of where it's going to go that's yeah. why it's the market so, so I missed a step who who would have the authority to change that, Nino or the mayor? I'm sorry. Ch change what? I'm sorry. To change it if the rate, if he could approve the change if the rate went down. And we no, we would have to dictate what the rate would be. Like we would say, if it went to 5.2, we authorize you to sign. Yes. Who are we authorizing? It would be the, the mayor. The, mayor, okay. the mayor is the only one that can sign okay. a contract. That's by what charter. I wanted to double check. Okay. No, I, I understand. I trust I you, Mr. Mayor. So <laughs> I'm for it. Nino, not so much. Or? <laughs> Nino's my man. So. Yes, Bill. So I, I don't know exactly between now and, and two weeks. I hear, I mean, I hear what you're saying. You know, we don't want to be, you know, rush into it. But if we, if we logically looked at what would be somewhere, but, you know, a low rate, and we gave the authority to the mayor to do that, Okay, what, what, we, that would be what we would be doing in, in probably in two weeks anyway. We see where the rates are going. So what would you, be your number? What would you feel comfortable with? Well, I feel pretty comfortable actually with, with the number that we're at now com right. compared to where, you know, what I presume is, as Councilwoman Hazeltine said, and, <laughs> and I think if the rest of us looked, I mean, I'm, we may, may all be paying more now. But, you know, I don't think we're going we're gonna to find like a three point something or a four. How do you know if, that? I don't know that. Right. But I think it's, it's looking for what's reasonable that you could lock in and say, okay, this is this looks like a pretty good this looks like a pretty good place to be because a, you know one point higher doesn't look like a good place to be, but I do think that the suggestion about giving the authority to the mayor is is about the only way that you could guarantee you could lock in it when, whenever it is hits that rate you want. No, I agree with that. I remember when we passed this through council back on September fifteenth, it was I believe. Then we had a thirty day waiting period to October fifteenth. The rate was at four point seven. Correct. Uh, on September 15th, and then we had 30 days to wait. The mayor signed the contract. We sent it to Energy Harbor. They didn't sign it. That was really the only difference because the rates went up. But again, you know, that was only um, less than two months ago. And I, again, you're correct. I don't know what the rate's going to be. It could go up to eight. But again, looking at what historically has done, and that's what I was trying to get the information from, we've been a lot lower than 5.4 historically, in my mind. Not me, apparently. Well, you're, you're, you're just <laughs> up right now. But I mean, in a month from now, it could be back down to 5.1. So if we give the mayor to authorize a lock-in. And my concern is if we lock-in at 5.3, let's say, or 5.4, of course, it's a great idea that people can opt out. But nobody's going to be sitting there every day watching the rates to say, OK, I'm going to opt out now. And then I'll opt back in if it goes up. So we have to view it as really nobody's going to opt out. That's kind of how we viewed it in the past, because nobody really opts out. Once you're in, you're in. Nobody follows it to opt out. So, I mean, I don't know. I, I, you know, do, am I comfortable with my personal opinions taking the risk for two weeks? Yes, maybe you're not. But I'm, I mean, we're going through a, a period of a rapid increase. And, and what I've found historically is rapid increase is always found by settling back down again. They don't always go up, up, up. There's always a settle back down. People panic and they, everything goes up and then it relaxes, just like in the stock market. So whatever you guys like to do, it's a majority of council it dictates what happens. So if you guys feel comfortable with 5.4 locking in, we could suggest that. And if there's a majority of vote on that, 
we could we we'll move forward. I mean, that's because there's seven of us up here. So we need four to agree with whatever number you want to agree with. Yes, Dan. Well, the only thing that worries me, <clears throat> and you're probably right, I mean, it, it very well could settle back down. But if we just looked at, at oil prices as, as a gauge, you know, for the last five months, it's continually increased. I mean, if you go to your gas station, you know, the price of regular gas has went from, I think, in in June from like 279 a gallon was up to like 335 or 340 and I have not seen in the last couple months of it decreasing mm -hmm. maybe a cent here or two cents there but it just it's steadily increased uh, so I you know waiting two weeks you know maybe we won't hit that 5.4 and then our you know two weeks if it's up to 5.8 are we going to wait again to say, well, let's now give the mayor a number if it gets back down to 5.4? You understand what I'm saying? Well, we do know that at least from a, from a gas perspective, winter's always higher, guaranteed. If you, if you wait to April, it might be back down to five or 4.5. Or 4 yeah, that's true. But, I mean, we're in a, in a situation where if it's all based upon natural gas, we're in the highest natural gas usage, and as we've known historically, the, the gas companies raise their prices when the highest amount of gas is used, which is going to be the winter months. They're going to be the highest price ever because that's the way they do it because they're, they know what happens. <laughs> so, Mr. President? Yes, Paul. Uh, to, to Denny's point, just today on the way in here, I heard on the radio that they, there's talk of shutting down yet another pipeline from Canada into the United States. So uh, maybe we don't know how many uh, electric generators are oil-powered or gas powered or coal powered or nuclear powered but that's got to have an impact somewhere in, in the supply chain someplace so but we um, do know that the prices are going to go up for the next couple of months that's a guarantee because they always go up agreed the agreed so if we wait to the spring there's no there's no but wait a minute, hold but we're talking electric here yes. and he showed us the chart he showed us the but electricity the electric powers use uh, gas right but the electric rate goes up in the summertime but it goes down in the spring Right, but it, it, it stays kind of low in the wintertime, too. So maybe we can buy a little bit of time here, but I, don't know. I, mean, I, wouldn't, go, I wouldn't go past the two weeks. No. We've got to make a decision next week, in next meeting. Wow. No. Missed. Right. Jim? No, I was going to, it's a mayor. Well, I just um, wondered if we have an idea about the county, like what they're, <coughs> where they set a rate at. I, do you know what rate they gave them authorization? Scott so Miller, he was talking about five two five one low fives, right? So okay. now, now what Energy Harbor, who we generally deal with directly, versus through Community Energy Advisors, they're saying that we may have to ride this out until April or May, before things come down. Mm -hmm. Now the only thing I'll, I'll share with Council, you, you probably know this already, but just in case, is that there's really no rush for us to get into this if the prices are so high. The disadvantage of that, though, is then the public is paying whatever that price is. For a so period of time, so, right. Well, yeah, until we get locked into a contract. Because right. there's, there's nothing to, if, if it goes up to seven or eight, you know, they're going to pay that at least December through April or May when, right. when we get locked into a contract. That's the disadvantage of it. But in the same respect, we don't want to lock into a contract that, that we all feel is, is unreasonable. So it's, it's trying to balance those two, and that's what we're explaining to folks on the phone. Myself, Sherry, and, and, and Nina, we're handling a variety of calls of folks and, and telling them, you know, just stay the course for right now. You're, you're going to go back. Uh, well, that, and, well, and as soon as we can get this worked out, if it's, if it's two weeks or if it's two months or the spring, we Well, I think will. you're correct. That's why I asked the question. Historically, like 10 years, what has the rate been? Because the best predictor of the future is history. And if history has always been in the fours, let's say, we should relax a little bit because we'll go back to the fours and that'll be beneficial to our residents. I mean, I agree that a couple months at a higher rate may be, may be tough for people and they may get nervous, but if historically it's been lower and you know, maybe Kevin can come back and tell us because he said he'd look at the 10 years, what has the 10 year number been? And that'll give us a better feeling of what we have to to look at. I, I guess I get nervous when we do it like a knee-jerk reaction because mm -hmm. it always works out poorly for us. 
So I don't think we should do that. Yes, understand that. Um, I was just wondering, does anybody in here or anybody know somebody, anybody that's in here knows somebody that does use um, residentially the aggregation program currently? I mean, I know the decision ultimately comes down to us, what we decide, but I would kind of like to hear some feedback about people that are currently in the program, what they think, because... When I you say like, in the program, in the program we used in, to have? Yes. Okay. That we're in the aggregate Because previously. I know they can, they can still opt out and they can go to a different supplier and maybe they've already locked in. People yes. who are very into this probably locked in already with somebody else because that's what they I'm just they wondering do. what those people think about what we do moving forward. So if anyone, the mass amount of people that are watching this right now, <laughs> um, <laughs> email Sweet me people. your thoughts because I'm I am spouses. genuinely curious as to people that actually use the aggregate what their thoughts are on it because i'm coming at this you know 10 years after the fact gathering information as i go so i you know honestly i would like to hear from people what what do you think please email me and tell me <coughs> okay okay is, is your question whether we're, we're, we use it yeah i was asking I, like whether you as an individual yeah i do oh i okay. do the city does uh well, I know the city does, but I'm talking about residentially, like the average yeah. person in Ward 1. Yeah, I do. My mother does. Okay. Um, well, what do you think, Mr. Mayor? <laughs> well, you know, anytime you can get a fixed locked price, uh, especially for our senior citizens, that's much easier to budget for yes. than something that this month it's this and the next month it's one and a half or two times that. So um, that's why we've worked very hard to, to try to control those costs. Uh, not only for our seniors, for our, our residents in, in general. And um, in my mind, and Nino can offer, he's got much more experience in, in this than I do, but um, I think it's served us well here, here for the last 10 years. That's a good point about the budgeting. I was not thinking yes. that far well, ahead. Well, that's true, but I'm just the opposite. I mean, I, maybe I'm more of a risk taker. I usually just float all the time because if we were locked in five years ago before they found the shale, in Ohio, you would have locked in at such a high rate that the rates would have been so much lower because once they found all the natural gas, of course the rates went down. But now I understand they're shipping it off. But overall, over time, I guess, it all averages out. Yeah. No matter what you do, you're probably gonna be very close. If you float on your own or lock in, over the long haul, you're all gonna be about the same rate. Councilman Rose would tell me that once I got used to paying that amount, and budgeted for that, that it would be easy peasy for me to go back down because I already knew how to use it on a smaller budget. <laughs> Lesson learned, Grasshopper. Okay. Yes, dear, you have a question? Yeah, we just had a comment on Facebook. Um, they were asking if the rates go down, uh, are residents able to travel out without having to pay the penalty? Yes. Yes, I think the, what we've heard from um, the energy um, advisors was that if you lock in and, and if the rates um, go up, you, you know, if it goes down, you can get out. And if the rates start going back up, you can get back in uh, no at the same rate that was locked in through the entire city. So <clears throat> if we locked in as a city at five, if the rates went down to four, you could opt out. But it's a 30-day period. You have to be in there at least for 30 days. And then if five months later the rates went to seven, you could say, I'm opting out of the seven. I want to go back into the five. That's what I heard you could do. Correct. Mm -hmm. So, yes, there's, there's flexibility. Uh, but the, the question that we're looking at, of course, currently is where do we want to get in at? Uh, because maybe we're at the high now. I mean, we don't know. It's, this is all, yeah, if we knew, we would be millionaires, but That's we right. don't know. So, so this is why we're trying to figure it out. Okay. Yes, Bill. So do we agree then, and, and it would be reasonable when we come back in two weeks, we wouldn't really have to set uh, for the mayor, it, okay, if it gets to 4.6, you can, you can do it. We could set, couldn't we set a range? We could say to give a little bit of flexibility that if it drops, you know, if the rate goes down to between this and this, he could make the decision. Uh, you know, I, I guess, and I'm not asking us to hurry, but it seems like without some, some flexibility, I mean, if you said if it goes down to 4.7, you can, you can sign. Well, what if it's 4.8, then you can't sign. It seems like administratively, we need to kind of take the, take the bridle off of this for the administration and give a reasonable uh, space to work. Well, I see what you're doing, but well, if I was the mayor and I was put with council with a, you know, uh, 
an edict to say if it's between 5.7 and 5.9 you can sign. If I was a mayor, I always sign in 5.9 because then I would never be, I mean, it's up to the mayor. I mean, do you, if you want a range mayor, we could give you a range, but that puts you in the hot seat, so to speak, that if, if it drops to 5.8 and you don't sign it, it jumps back up to 6.2, you get the heat. I'm, I'm not saying to give that kind of a range. I mean, uh, maybe a minimal range, just so that it's not a specific number, because a specific number, to me, you, it doesn't, make, doesn't really make much sense. But a, range, a, a, a minimal range leaves some, leaves some flexibility and I don't think that it's, you know, it's being, um, you know, we're being not, you know, less than cautious because I think, you know, the mayor can look at it and, 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 and he can actually, he, he can confer with us individually or just talk. And, I, and I'm pretty confident he could make that decision. I mean, then we would be okay with it. I would be okay with it. And, and, you know, no, you know we're, there's no guarantee when, you, when we do it. It's not like you're... You know, we're going to go, okay, well, you did it now and you really messed up because, you know, we could have got a, a one, one point less. But um, I just think there has, to be, there has to be a reasonable flexibility in, the, in this decision. Some leeway. Thank you. Mayor? I think it would be helpful to me if we, if you just told me what the cap is. If you, yeah. if you tell me, for argument's sake, that it's 5.1 and it comes in at 4.9, I'm feeling better. Okay. I'm going to sign it right now. Anything below? If it below. comes in at 4.8, if it comes in, you know, any, anything uh, equal to or less than 5.1, then we're, we're probably going to sign it with the understanding that I, we could sign it at 5.1, say, the day after your decision and council's decision, uh, and the next day it might go a little bit lower. But, you know, when, when you sign, you sign because that's the risk. It could also go higher. So mm -hmm. at, at some point we, we just you know, have, have, to, have to make a decision and, and, and try to lock in the best we can do. And as John said, e eventually it's gonna, it's gonna balance out, it's gonna go up and down. Okay, okay, everybody okay with that? Okay, okay. Um, we have 21-213 Second Amendment to EMS Agreement with Medina Hospital. Mayor? Well, thank you, Mr. President. I, I, I believe there's a typo in the agreement and I apologize I didn't catch it. Because um, for as long as I've been here, we've, we've done these in five-year increments. And they call it a five-year term. But if you add January 1, 2022 to December 31st, 2027, that's actually six years. So I've um, emailed the president's uh, secretary or assistant and told her I just caught this on the floor. So I would ask that we um, pass amending it from 1-1-22 to 1231. 2026, which would be a five-year term, okay. um, and ask them to amend the agreement to reflect what the wording actually is. Any questions? Uh, move to approve as amended. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 All opposed? Motion carries. 21-214, uh, 2022 membership renewal to Main Street, Medina. I guess, Mayor, do you want to start this? Yeah. Yes, sir. Still making notes. So this is uh, the city annually provides a $30,000 stipend um, to Main Street. Um, for, the, for those that may be watching that aren't familiar with Main Street, Main Street uh, is a, is a uh, organization in the city uh, that, that um, plans all of the events or the, the majority of the events on the square, the activities, uh, supports our local businesses up there and brings the mass amount of visitors to the downtown uh, with the various events, which then benefit not only the businesses on the square, but the city as a whole. Uh, because if people come to the square, they may still stop uh, you know, at a gas station, at a, at a, at a restaurant, at a store, and, and, and buy some things. And in my mind, uh, we've provided you the um, the year in review for 2021 and I think Matt can answer any questions uh, that that you all have but but when you take that thirty thousand dollars and and look at what it's leveraged it's um, conservatively in excess of 1.5 million dollars that that economic impact on our community which is a 50 to 1 return on investment and I could I couldn't uh, I couldn't be more 
um, enthusiastic about asking for council's uh, renewal of this. Uh, I, we're very pleased with everything Main Street's doing. Um, the, it's getting better and better every year. Um, and and uh, I just want to thank Matt and the board for all, all that you're doing. Thank you, Matt. Do you have anything to add? Yes, Mr. President, I do, but I don't have any fancy graphs and line things and <laughs> figures. Um, just real quick, Mr. President, created in 2007, Main Street Medina is going to celebrate our 15th anniversary in 2022. In 15 years, we've generated over $20 million of economic impact for the city. In 2007, there was a 30% vacancy in the rate, and in 2022, we will be entering essentially our ninth year of 100% occupancy. Several years ago, we expanded into Southtown, giving us the ability to do more development and to create more special events. In 2022, we're going to focus on destination marketing for tourism to get more people to come here and to spend more money in our local businesses. So I appreciate your consideration, and as the mayor said, I would be happy to answer any questions. Sure. Anybody have any questions? Paul? Hi, Matt. Thank you for all the great work you guys do. We, we do appreciate it. Thank uh, you. You, know, you make life easier for us. Okay. <laughs> Not easy, but easier. <laughs> okay. But I do have one question with the city investment of 30000 You estimated 2,464 2, hours volunteered, and you estimated a value of $28.54. Which executives are you that is getting to volunteer for you <laughs> those no those numbers are directly from my friend the google that is the standard your going friend rate. google that's not my, my friend, friend google the standard rate for volunteer time so we should never undervalue our volunteers okay, even though the minimum rate that most of the people are paid in town here are, is in the area 10 to 12 dollars an hour i hear what you're saying councilman but salary is far different than knowledge and power yeah but <laughs> Okay, all right. Even if you take that in half, we're still generating a lot of good stuff in the city. Well, true. And even at half, we're getting our money back. Yes, sir. And then some. Yeah, I agree. Okay, just curious. Thank you. Any other questions? Mrs. Hazeltine? Not a question. Just massive praise for Main Street Medina and all that they do. Um, I appreciate you. I appreciate George. You guys are doing a great job. I know you've been working with uh, Councilman Lamb on Southtown, so exciting things coming there. Um, I don't volunteer with Main Street as much as I used to, but I am looking forward to, it's next weekend, correct? Is the decorating of the square? Uh, this coming weekend is decorating the square. The following weekend, the 19th to the 21st is Candlelight Walk. Just kidding. This I wish weekend, we had another week in between. This weekend, I am going, I'm planning in my brain right now, everybody can hold me accountable to come help decorate. Okay. Because it is a magical tradition, so I encourage everyone out there if you have not done it at least one time, you should do it because it is really fun. Thank you. Any other questions? Bill? Thanks, Matt. Um, it's an incredible partnership, and I think people recognize the partnership between the city and Main Street, or they don't recognize the partnership necessarily. But if you know about the partnership, you know why it is that there's 100% occupancy downtown and why every time you have an event, you turn out hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people not only to have a good time, but to spend money and build the economy of the city. You know, it's, it's, an, it's an absolutely outstanding partnership, you know, that has paid, you know, paid beyond what anybody would have ever, ever expected. And, and a lot of the credit goes to the board, but a lot of that credit goes to you too. So I really appreciate what you do. Thank you. Thank you very Thank much. You. Any other comments, questions? Okay. Who did approve? Wholeheartedly second. All in favor? Aye. 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 All opposed? Motion carries. Thank you, Matt. Thank you for your service. Uh, 21-215, Amend Service of Benefit Code 3105 for the Sanitation Department. Okay, we have Mr. Lineker here and Mr. Bacoli. Thank you, Mr. President. I'll start. Uh, we bring this request to the council in the hopes of resolving some of the uh, staffing issues in sanitation. Um, currently, we are two supervisors. Actually, John is the superintendent and Jared who's the foreman, Jared Joyce, nine MEOs, and on the books are actually, yes, working or two laborers. Typically we have seven part-time laborers. So typically we have seven. So I don't need to speak to the integrity of sanitation and the service we deliver. I'm pretty sure council's aware of what we do day in and day out. Um, President Coyne asked a great question when I spoke to him about this. Um, 
with respect to not presenting at the, uh, not bringing this up during the budget hearing um, about needing additional staffing. And so where we're at, that was I think in May. So John is here has said numerous times how he thought we could weather the storm and hopefully bring in, he's done a phenomenal job, he and Jared are bringing in part-time folks and then they transition in time if they obtain a CDO into a full-time position. Well, that pool of part-time folks has seemed to dry up. Um, I know other, other businesses, industries, they're all feeling the same, but we feel by making uh, full-time MEO positions um, in the realm of two that we could um, attract um, because the reputation of the city, the benefits, the, the retirement, the, the whole ball of wax here at the city um, would be intriguing. Um, because the way we're structured now, um, we have the Teamsters, which we have a great rapport with. Um, any opening in, in a vacancy with the union rank and file is filled by a, a fellow union full-timer. They have first dibs on the, on the postings. If it's not filled through that, um, through that realm, then the part-time union are eligible to be promoted and they bid for a job and then interviews and so forth. Um, we've not hired from the outside with respect to original appointment, I think in 12 years, maybe longer, because of the folks we've been bringing in, you know, day to day, um, doing the jobs that they do. Um, but again, it's been taxing and John's here to answer some questions. We have supervisors driving routes, throwing trash. We have um, what typically is a two-man labor on the back of a truck. We have a good driver getting out and handling the two labor positions as well as driving, and, and that just can't continue um, in our minds. Well, well thanks, Dino. You, you, you have a nice soft entry. You said the realm of two, but it's three. <laughs> it, it is. We <laughs> talked about that to have it on the books um, as three because civil service doesn't need to approve the uh, the amount of folks because the classification is there, the um, so city want, council would. So you have want to, to move really what you're doing is you're moving two part timers to three full time MEOs, and, the, and I know you did the numbers already. What's the cost difference? So we're looking at 190 thousand dollars, I believe, for the two MEOs. Um, we do have that and carry forward. Keith can speak to every year. We've we've had 450 thousand dollars and carry forward. Having said that, though, fuels at four dollars plus for. A gallon, everything's going up as well. Um, the only, the only, um, the only thing we're looking at um, besides the carry forward is there's a discussion going on next week. The John and I are uh, meeting with the policy waste committee at the county. They're looking at the CPF um, and other options with respect to what's going on there. Um, the tip fees may come down. We're not sure, but that we can't base this decision on that. That would just be an added. Uh, benefit to this proposal if that were to happen as well. So if you go to, you, you keep saying two MEOs, but it's three, um, are, are we going to remove then three part-timers just to even it out? Because you're going from seven part-timers, I think you'd go to four part-timers and then three more new full-timers. Is that correct? Go ahead, John. I guess my question for you is, are we going to find people to fill any part-time positions going Well, that's forward? what I'm, I'm figuring. You probably won't. So that's why I said... So, so currently amongst our MEO staff, I have one guy working that should have retired two years ago. I have another guy that's eligible within three years and another one within five and seven, et cetera. So my thinking is, is the adjustments in the economy can accommodate for maybe not filling those MEO positions when they become available, if that makes sense. I get it, but you need them. We, we need them now, yes. What I'm thinking is maybe in the near future, we may not need them. So I guess that's up for you guys to say, do we eliminate the part-time positions and then if need be, we put them back in later? I think in yes, order to because keep the, the way we cleaner. budget, you budget for full employment. So right. if you leave them in there, you're budgeting extra money. Right. So, but you need full-timers and the reason you need full-timers is because part-timers don't want to work because right. there's no part-time. We just can't get them. Yes. Right, that's what I'm saying. There, yes. So I, I get it. You'd rather have full-timers and that makes a lot of sense. Well, we just need somebody. But yes. with the full-timers <laughs> come with, well, okay. you need somebody, but full-timers is more enticing because if you have a full-time job, you have benefits, you have, you know, you're is, working yes. more than 29 and a half hours a week, you're doing all these things that are great. It which is. Which I think is... is and, and it's more competitive unique. in the market because right now right. we just can't even compete. And if, if I may, John, interject the uh, CDL aspect. So 
currently our protocol is if, if a young person comes in, has a driver's license, wants to obtain a CDL, we help those folks um, while they're here, they, they obtain the CDL temps, they drive city sure, vehicles sure. with the driver, and then we reimburse them, they take the test, they become CDL certified, qualified. But I mean, from a budgetary perspective, and I know your carrier for will cover it, with moving up to three full-time MEOs, changing it from nine to 12, you know, I think it, it would, to me, it makes sense just to get rid of three part-timers because we want more full-timers than part-timers. I, I would say that's safe because you'd okay. be offsetting the cost by about 27,000 a year then based correct. upon their wages, yes. That is correct, yes. Anybody have any questions for them? Paul? Okay, this, this, these funds come out of the enterprise fund, correct? Correct. Yes, sir. Okay, all right, so it won't impact the general fund. All right. Okay. I'm okay with it. Danny, you have something? No. No. Oh. Anything else? Else? I was just going to say I did sit through the civil service presentation last week when uh, Nina talked to civil service. And as much as I hope this works, John, there's also a really good chance even going to full time, you still might not find the people you need. I'm right. finding that every day with uh, our situation. You are school. correct because <laughs> it is hard to compete with 20 three to $25 an hour with a thousand dollar bonus yep. down the road. And I, even trying I, to sell the fact I completely that understand that. And yeah. I'm hopeful that we can find maybe mm -hmm. a, a small job pool out there of people that um, don't want to over the road truck or don't want to work more than 40 or 50 or 60 hours a week in the trucking industry. And it's more appealing for them to come work for us. But we have what the private industry doesn't have. You are correct. Government health care coverage. Yes. Right, yeah. <laughs> that was my point with the benefits. <laughs> yep, you are correct there. That is a big, yes. that's big. It is. It is. And so home every I, night. Yeah. So and I, home every night. Yeah. So I guess um, I'd entertain a motion to change the full-time MEOs from 9 to 12 by also reducing the part-time uh, staff from 7 to 4. I will make that motion to change the, the full-time from 9 to 12 and reduce the it's actually six to part-time is it seven to four or is it six to three? Six, six to, to three. I thought it was seven. We, so we, we run over. We usually run a seasonal. <laughs> oh, okay, I got you. Yes. Okay, so six to three. So six to three. Second. Is that okay with you guys? Absolutely. Absolutely. We Thank appreciate you. the consideration. Okay, all in favor? Aye. 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 All opposed? Motion carries. Thank you. There you go. Okay, now we go, we have eight, nine, and ten, which I think are being pulled from the agenda. Is that correct, Mr. Jansen? Mr. Worley? We're going to poll eight and nine, and I'm going to respectfully ask to change the account number on number 10. Okay, so eight and nine are getting removed from the agenda, and the reason they're being removed because the ARP funds we uh, was determined by our legal counsel that these particular purchases would not be covered by the ARP funds, so that's why they're being removed. So let's go to number 10, which is 21218, purchase of a new step trainers, MCRC, not using ARP funds, but what funds would you be using? Yeah. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. So uh, this request uh, originally was part of a CDBG grant, um, and then we had changed it, being hopeful we could use ARP funds. Um, but uh, come to find out we're not able to, we are going to respectfully ask that the account number for this purchase be changed from 171 to 574 um, to use our carry forward funds. These are new step trainers that are predominantly used by seniors um, and those with limited mobility in the facility. Um, they're uh, trainers that uh, move your extremities for you um, and are easily accessible um, from 360 degrees. Uh, the original uh, units these are replacing uh, were purchased, as you could see on the request, 2010 and 2009. We're asking to trade in three of those units. We do have a fourth one that was purchased later in 2013 that we're gonna keep. Um, we're uh, looking to make this purchase because uh, the, the, the three that we have are reaching the end of their service life and, and are no longer um, per new step uh, available for parts. Thank and you. I believe if one, of the, one or more of the new step trainers, weren't they donated by some other nonprofits at some point? Uh, it was my understanding that we use Cleveland Clinic wellness funds. Oh, was it? Okay. Yes. Okay. Anybody have any questions? Move to approve. Second. All in favor? Aye. All opposed? Motion carries. 21219 field expansion project for Miracle League Parks Department. Mr. Worley. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, Ken Richardson's here from the Miracle League. Um, on the uh, request, uh, that I submitted, you might recall, we have a ground lease with the Miracle League that we executed back in 2015. 
um, when the Miracle League first approached the city to renovate the infield of the uh, field at Sam Macy Park. Uh, they have done a number of improvements since 2015 at the facility. Um, they did resurface about a little shy of 8,000 square feet of the infield with a port in place rubberized surfacing uh, at a, a cost of approximately $54,000. They since then have uh, contributed along with the Stevenson Foundation for a permanent vault restroom. Uh, they have paid for uh, bringing power into the facility um, for their announcer stand. They also constructed an announcer stand. Um, and the Miracle League uh, is interested in taking their efforts into the outfield so that uh, the individuals uh, with physical and mental disabilities are able to get the full experience of playing baseball. Um, what they're looking to do is add about 5,000 square feet of uh, concrete along with port and place surface and installing a new home run fence that is actually closer um, so that uh, the children and adults that are participating in the program are able to get that full experience. Um, they've kicked off their fundraising already. Um, it's my understanding they have approximately $75,000 secured uh, for this project that is uh, estimated at $131,450. The lease that we have uh, executed with them was for an initial period of 10 years with the option to extend for an additional 10 years. And reading through that lease, uh, Article 5, uh, additional consideration allows for continued improvements as long as they're provided to the city uh, in writing and the Miracle League pays for the improvements and complies with all the terms in the lease. Um, I've met with Ken uh, several times now regarding this project. Um, they do have all their ducks in the row. They reach out to Cunningham and Associates to get an actual drawing that will be submitted to our engineering department with elevations, they have uh, three quotes that I also included uh, to help establish the budget. And um, Ken met with Mayor Hanwell and I uh, probably a month or two ago to discuss this, and we felt that it was best to bring this to you because of the dollar amount, um, as well as uh, Mr. Heber was re reviewing the lease to make sure that uh, we were good to move forward. I'll, I don't know if Ken has anything to say or if you have any questions for him, he might be able to help. First of all, I'd like to say thank you uh, for the lease that we do have. We have a great relationship with the city of Medina. You've helped us to be a very successful organization. Uh, Jansen has been there anytime we need assistance or guidance. Uh, Mayor Hanwell and the council, uh, your support is, is fantastic. Uh, but I've got to ask you, have all of you visited our field? Because if you haven't, you can, you can get a tour from me. I'll be glad to take you on a tour. I will take uh, you up on that. Okay, great. <laughs> Just give me a call or go through Jansen and we'll, we'll get you set up. Uh, and also, our season runs through the middle of May to the end of July, so make sure you come down and, and watch a game 6.30 uh, in the evening. Uh, the thing that I, I just wanted to say is this is uh, a culmination of something that started in 2012. We, we had uh, the concrete in the infield. We had a surface that was a practice field uh, that we got for free, just for shipping, from a university. And we put that down. And that, that had been in there, on there since 2001. And by 2012, we needed to do something about that. That's when we put the new surface on the infield. But we've always, since 2012, thought we want to do the whole field. Our wheelchairs and our walkers and anybody that that is unsteady on their feet which we do have uh, players that are in that situation can access the outfield and we want to be a fully accessible organization we want our wheelchairs zipping around and they're motorized they go pretty fast and and we now because we have the, the surface in the infield we no longer have bases that stick out of the ground they're just flat and and they're marked uh, on the surface so when they run the bases they move and so 
we want them in the outfield also. And the home run fence is, is something that's very special because, uh, well, you see Major League Baseball, the home runs everything. And they want to emulate their heroes, and now they can do that. We, we've got a home run fence that's reachable. It was a fabric one, and by the end of the season, it, it gets a little uh, uh, pliable and, and starts leaning over, and we have to constantly fix it. This is going to give us an opportunity to put in a permanent one, a four-foot uh, chain-link fence with, with foul poles, and, and, and it'll be something that will be, make, make the whole field look better also. And one last thing, we're also going to include uh, an area outside of the center field where we can put in a structure. Uh, we haven't quite determined how it's gonna look yet, but that will commemorate some of the coaches and players that we've lost through the years. Plus, it'll, it'll honor the past, the present, and the future. And so we wanted to make something special like that. But the joy of Miracle League baseball is, is unlike anything, anything uh, you can find in most places, and, and it's very special. We just, we just got uh, uh, sent a player to Houston, Texas uh, for the weekend. They had a national Miracle League all-star game. And he, he was in Houston. They were at Minute Maid Park. Uh, they played on the field out there, and they had a wonderful time. So what we're asking is let us finish the field by approving our addendum to the lease, which, uh, like, like Jansen said, we're, we're in the sixth year of a 10-year portion of that, and we, we've really appreciated our relationship, and we want to keep making Sam Massey Park look very special. So thank you. Thank can, you. Who could yes. say no to that? Ken, <laughs> could you uh, inform the council of how many uh, youth and adults participate in your program? Yes, uh, we have 121 players in our program. 80 of them are uh, mostly between the ages of five and probably about 15. Uh, and then we have 41 that are, uh, well, they're 16, 17, all the way up to our oldest player last year was 54 years old. <laughs> And by the way, at the national organization, uh, the national all-star game, they had a 72-year-old player out on the field. So I don't know where we are going to end up uh, as far as age, but there's, there's no limit as to how old they are. And uh, we have, from the city of Medina, we actually have 62 players. Wow. And then from the Medina County, 98 players from Medina County. And so the other 20, 23 are from our surrounding communities, as far uh, north as Avon, and then Wooster it would be the farthest south we draw from. Great. Thank Great. you for all Thanks. you do, sir. Yes. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? I, I'd just like to make a comment. I, Ken, I want to thank you, because I know you thanked all of us, but I know your passion, your commitment, your dedication to that. It's just amazing, and you know, I'm fortunate enough, I've been around long enough to deal with Ron Knight first, and now I'll work with you. And I'm so proud of that facility and what it does for our residents that use it, and, but I know you're the driving force, and the amount of hours and time you put into it, it's just amazing. I really admire you Thank for that. Thank you, Jim. And uh, I'd be remiss if I did not point out the greatest ambassador, your daughter, Kelly. <laughs> um, I hope she's watching at home tonight and knows that we send a shout out to her because uh -huh. She always Wait, tells me Kelly when she Beagle? sees you and the mayor. <laughs> Which Kelly are we talking about? My daughter, Kelly. She's 38 years old. She's been playing in the league since uh, 1998. All right. And she loves baseball. Yeah. I do, too. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Ken. Thank you. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Uh, move to approve. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 All opposed? Motion carries. Thank you. 21-220 expenditure to Mason Custom Builders for the Service Department, Mr. Piccoli. Thank you, Mr. President. So the Rotunda Drop Ceiling Project comes to us um, as phase two, you recall, we replaced the HVAC unit and then the um, VAV boxes ensuing, there's 40, you're probably tired of me talking about them. We're, we're doing really well with the installation of those. So the long and short of it is above us in the rotunda, there are four large VAV boxes that need uh, to be changed out. And it, in, in doing that, it will open up a large area of these uh, one by one acoustic tiles. 
So if you look around, we talked about it in the public buildings budget, if you remember me bringing it up, especially above uh, Councilwoman Hazeltine, where they're disrupted. Once you open those up, they're, they're supposed to snap back in place, but they do not. Was that by design? Just curious. The opening or the? <laughs> the fact that it's above my head. <laughs> no, that's been like that for a while, but they're loosening up if you look around. So the long and short of it is we want to um, present this project with using the American Rescue Plan Act and in conjunction with the HVAC, uh, replace the, uh, it will end up installing a drop ceiling and then the vestibules, the openings, the um, four doors um, will be involved as well. New lighting, um, what you see is the four by one lighting will be two by two LED lighting. Um, there are some LED lights in the perimeter and we plan to repurpose, if we can, some of the LED lights that will be taken down um, in this project as well. Timing? Timing will be, we talked about the um, first, well, it'll be the only council meeting in December, which is the second Monday. We're hopeful that there'll be no more. We talked to the contractor, um, our HVAC contractor, and told him we have a window from that second Monday to the end of the year, actually beginning of the year when we have the organizational meeting. Um, in that time, in that timeline, the HVAC can be um, replaced. It'll only take a couple of days from what we're understanding. We have a lift on standby. And then in talking to um, Todd Mason with Mason Builders, he could work on the perimeter while that's going on um, with the VAV boxes above um, with the vestibules and, and so forth. So, it's a crunch and we have to get it done because obviously you can't have the rotunda here disrupted in the beginning of the year with the, with the meeting. So we have a small window. We appreciate that. Any other questions? Move to approve. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank Opposed? you. Opposed? Motion carries 21 221 amend code 94309 special endowment fund. Jansen. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, an ordinance that's on tonight's council agenda, uh, 18121 actually amends cemetery ordinance 94311, which uh, is in regards to our cemetery fees. At the last finance can, uh, committee meeting, uh, we discussed uh, striking the special lot endowment fund as an op as an option for uh, an additional purchase. Uh, 94309 uh, is a specific ordinance. Um, pertaining to the special lot endowment fund. So this request would be to amend that ordinance to continue care for those that are enrolled in the program prior to December 31st, 2021. So when we implement the new fees in 2022, uh, we will continue um, the special lot endowment care for those families that have enrolled in it prior to December 31st. Thank you, any questions? Move to approve. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries 21 2022 health insurance renewal for medical mutual. Mayor? Thank you, Mr. President. I'm happy to report to the council that uh, we're, <coughs> we're able uh, with our renewal uh, at zero percent um, to stay with medical mutual. Um, they're pleased with the programs that the city is doing. Um, and, and are controlling the, uh, the costs. And uh, I'd just like to mention uh, uh, Dino Shuley uh, from DS, what, what was D DS Benefits, it's a new name now, but he's still here locally and they worked very hard to, to get this whittled down for us uh, because Medical Mutual did not come in originally at the 0%, so they, they kept working on it, kept working on it, and um, I'm, I'm pleased with the result. And, uh, if, if finance passes it tonight and then council passes it on November 20, 22nd, and this was our goal, is that we could, we could pass it uh, without the emergency clause. It seems like most years we're up against the wall and trying to get all the paperwork signed. So I give, again, Dino, Dino and his staff a lot of credit because usually they can't get the uh, health care providers to talk to them much earlier than August. And to get this all put together and, and at a very favorable rate is, is commendable. Great. Thank you. Any questions? Move to approve. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed? Motion carries. 21 223 repay advances. Keith. These are advances that we're repaying. And advances, if you don't know, are uh, loans from one fund to another. Um, the bulk of them are for grant projects, but we do do them for other things as well. Any questions? Move to approve. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. 
Opposed, motion carries 21-224, rollover of outstanding advances. These are rollovers of uh, advances where we're not repaying them, we're, we're continuing them on for another year. Moved, moved to approve. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed, motion carries, and 21-225 fund advance request. These are new ones. Uh, this, there's only one here, this is special assessments. When uh, like people don't mow their grass and we go out and mow it, we put a special assessment, but we have to pay the contractor that cuts the grass right away and we don't get that money back until it gets collected by the county, so we have to cover it in the meantime. Any questions? Move to approve. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed? Motion carries. All right, anything else to come before finance before we recess into executive session? Okay. If nope. not, I'll make a motion at 7 p.m. to go into executive session for the purpose of uh, considering the purchase of property for public purposes. If uh, premature disclosure of information would give an unfair competitive bargaining advantage to, a, to the person whose personal private interest is adverse to the public interest. And who's to attend? Uh, the mayor. My, myself, uh, Mr. Huber and Jansen, please. Mr. Huber and Jansen, Worley. Will the clerk please call the roll? Lamb. Oh, second. Thank you, I think. Will the clerk please call the roll? <laughs> Lamb. Bill. Yes. Rose. Yes. Shields. Yes. Coyne. Yes. Simpson. Yes. Heffinger. Yes. Hazeltine. Yes. Motion passes. We'll be recessing an executive session to discuss land acquisition, re reconvening into finance after the executive session, taking no action on any item discussed in the executive session, and then adjourning from finance and moving on to council. We are in recess. <laughs>